All right, we're live. Pedro from ANP Reacts. I'm here with Yari from Winter Sun. Welcome. Thank you very much. I, I love your I love your coffee mug. <laughs> <laughs> Birthday present. Really? Yeah. I just turned forty uh, last year. I, I turned forty last month. All right. <laughs> uh, we we've got. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we uh, we've passed that middle point in our lives where I think from now on everything is downhill. Actually, I think it was from thirties. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I still I, I still feel good, you know. I, I, I agree with you. I, agree I can definitely you. feel, you know, a little bit energy running out, you know. Mentally, I feel better. But physically, you know, it starts to get. I, I think you go for runs and you know to the gym and stuff. I think the brain uh, becomes wiser while your body becomes weaker. Yeah, that's true. I think that's. I true. think I was very. Um, I've always been very th very thin since I was a kid. So I actually, I think I have more muscle now than ever. <laughs> actually, <laughs> that's but that's that's a positive. You, yeah. you need those muscles when you're on stage. And I noticed after when I turned 30 that I started to lose energy and I didn't eat very healthy. So that was the turning point. I started to go to the gym and eating, eating better and it definitely pays off. You're much happier and, uh, you know, playing live, you don't die on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> That's important. I mean, yeah. you don't want to collapse during a solo or in the middle of a chorus. Yeah. I wanted to start our, our, our day with the question about Winter Sun by request. Where did that idea come from? Actually, it was Temu's idea, I think, because we played um, last autumn in Finland. So we wanted to do something special for this year, do something different, not play the same set. So I think Temu, Temu came up with this idea and uh, we thought about it for a while and then we said, okay, let's do it. Although it's going to be a challenge because we have to learn pretty much all the songs we have. I was going to say, do, doing doing concerts by request, it, it does create a different dynamic because, you know, if the fans vote on a song that you guys haven't performed live in a long time, that means you guys have to go back to the well and almost relearn that song all over again. Yeah, that's true. And all the, all the shows are different. There's a different set list. So actually yesterday... The voting was ended, so and we actually figured out the set list already. They're kind of in the ballpark right now, and so there's different, three different set lists. So it's gonna be fun. And those set lists, is there any one song that concerns you a little bit more than all the others? One that perhaps is a little bit more difficult to pull it off in a live setting? Well, basically those songs that we haven't played in a while. Because we pretty much played the same songs now uh, for the last year, you know, the same set. So now there's a lot of new songs to learn or relearn. So, I mean, there's just, for me, it's mostly like remembering all the lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you know, of course, you know, you use it, the dynamics of this at least, you know, all the speeches between the songs and stuff like that because i'm always nervous about those <laughs> that, that that poses to me a question that i never really thought about is when you guys are putting the set list together i'm not not specifically from this show but even on any other show is it really important the the order in which the songs comes like do you really guys take the time to think about how you want that set to really be yeah, it's I not a random it, thought right yeah i think it's important you know it's good to go uh, good to go on the stage with a bang and then leave the stage with a bang and you know of course have uh, you know have like a dynamic set that goes up and down up and down so there's no boring moments and if if we play fast all the time then it gets boring and if we play slow all the time then it get, gets boring and it's yeah. also good to you know do surprises and stuff stuff like that Speaking of, of playing live, you guys had the tour with uh, Arch Enemy in Europe with Tribulation and Ginger. How was yeah. that experience? Yeah, that, that was really great. I mean, the point of that tour was, you know, to gain new fans for us. Because, you know, we're not still that big band. So that was our man manager's idea. And I, I think it paid off because there was a lot of, uh, a lot of people that came to say, uh, talked to us after a show and they said, you know, they be became fans 
you know, seeing us for the first time. So you, you really had, had it was a, and it was a huge tour, you know, playing a big, big venues, you know. So it was really kind of mind blowing. You think that is the kind of tour that will open the doors for you guys to perhaps do a similar tour, but with you as the headliners, not as the supporting act? Yeah, I hope so. That's, that that was the plan. And uh, the, the the feedback that I've seen online in terms of the tour and and how the the whole experience was, it seems to have been a really positive one. Um, is, is there something that you take from seeing a band like Arch Enemy perform live that you can take back in, into the lab, if you will, and uh, kind of cater to what Winter Sun does going forward in their live performances? Yeah, it's always been like that. We've been, you know, <clears throat> uh, supporting Exodus and Amon Amart, and we always uh, look to these bigger bands and see what they do and, uh, you know, try to improve ourselves, you know, the whole show and, you know, all, all the speeches and the light show and stuff. So we always try to improve the show. Uh, and, uh, of course, you learn. And, of course, I was, you know, from YouTube, you know, big band show so that also is very important do, do you prefer the the smaller venues or the big outdoor venues in terms of the interaction that allows you to have with the fans uh i mean it changes for me sometimes i prefer you know big outdoor show but sometimes little just a little venue with like a very intimate you know the fans are right in your face you know sweat flying <laughs> all around so that's that's also fun yeah, I, for, for me, from a fan's perspective, I always prefer the smaller venue. It kind of makes it almost feel like the band is performing just for me, even though there's yeah. other people there. There's many times we've come to a little, little venue and we're like, fuck, <laughs> <laughs> this, is the, this is the place. <laughs> but then the show, the show is going to be actually the, probably the best show ever. So that, that always. Pays it's one off. of those things you can't judge the book by its cover. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> um, the, the I, want, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about your creative process and, and I would be a complete fool if I didn't ask you this question because I think this is one of those questions that if you ask a hundred Winter Sun fans 99 of them are going to uh, want to hear an answer to this question and the question is how important is a sauna in the creative process of Winter Sun? It's very important. <laughs> <laughs> Can't do it without it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I had to ask that question because I think but everybody, everybody the whole day. It's, it's very important to have a relaxing time at sauna with one beer. <laughs> <laughs> as a group, I'm assuming. Process all that difficult composing. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I love that. I, I think I think it's. I, I honestly, I'm starting to think that sauna and, and the sauna experience is really a Finnish uh, byproduct of Finnish uh, metal bands. Because I, I don't know if you're aware, I uh, Morse Principal Mess was touring in Japan, and the first thing they did when they got there is they went to a sauna. So yeah. I, I'm starting to think it's 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 a perhaps a cultural thing. Do you do you think so? I think so. Yeah, pretty much. When I was a kid, you know, my family. We always on Saturdays went to the sauna, and even in my childhood apartment building, there was a kind of little pool that that was really cool. And sometimes my friends came to the sauna with me, and we just had fun in the pool, and it was so great. And uh, I think most most apartments in Finland have saunas, like in apartment buildings. Wow, so it's pretty pretty nice. That that is nice. Here here we don't we don't at all. I mean, and it's then, a and of course. Many Finnish people have these summer cabins where they go out in the summer and the saunas are in near the lake so you can just go swim after the sauna. Wow. So that's, that's really great. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm from Portugal. We have a family from Finland that lives in my small town, a really, really small town in Portugal. And yeah. they bought a house uh, on the hill. And the first thing they did when they bought that house is they built a sauna. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's the first thing they did, and it's built into the the wall of the mountain, so it's really, really rustic. It's really, really beautiful. Cool. Is it an electric sauna or, or no? Wall? No, it's not electric at all. I think they have the stones and everything. And the real thing. 
You're yeah. Like, you put the water on the stones. It's, nice. Yeah, you can barely actually see the entrance because it's like they curved it out of the rock. So really, really cool. Uh, you, you mentioned before we even started that you start playing guitar at the age of 15. What was the inspiration uh, that drove you to pick up the guitar at that age? Well, first of all, my, my father played guitar. And uh, then he built me this uh, half acoustic guitar. And I tried to first learn it, but then it was really, really, really difficult. And it hurt my fingers. I thought, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> And then I just put it in the corner of the room and didn't touch it for a year or two. But then my friend um, Oliver, who actually was the drummer in Ensiferum, and we have been childhood buddies ever since. And uh, uh, his mom got his got him a guitar and a guitar amp, and he was playing these Metallica riffs, you know, Master of Puppets and Enter Sam. And I was like, that's fucking cool. <laughs> <laughs> then I went back home and picked up that guitar that my father had built me and I started to learn all those stuff and I just really fell in love you know the guitar and ever since I've been just uh, kind of been obsessed you know learning learning the guitar so you were you self-taught for most of it like you didn't take lessons or anything like that yeah most of it I went to some private uh, guitar lessons at early on like I don't know a year or two but uh I think most of it was just, you know, from tablature books and um, these v VHS tapes, you know, these Guitar Heroes, Ball Killerbird and, you know, Chris Impellet Impellitary, you know, guys guys like that. Do you still have the guitar that your dad made? Yes, I have it. Do you still pick it up once in a while for... Uh... Well, actually, I haven't picked it up in a long time. It's actually, actually, my mother has it now because... I have so much stuff, <laughs> so can you take some of my stuff to your <laughs> You need to clear some of the clutter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, what life experiences have driven you to, to be such a perfectionist? Because I, I saw the documentary that you guys put together during the, the Four Seasons um, uh, crowdfunding process, uh, and to me, you came across as somebody who is you're not happy with reaching 95%. If it's not at 100% of what you feel is what not only you can do better, but what, what the fans expect from you, it's not good enough. So what, what life experiences, what has driven that, that drive, that, 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 uh, that strive for perfection? It's very hard to say. I, I've been thinking about it myself. Um, but I, yeah, I've noticed uh, from myself that um, I'm very good at finding flaws in everything. <laughs> <laughs> me also in me too. <laughs> so uh, you know, anything—it's a guitar or I hear a new album. I, I pick up things that ah oh, shit. You know, I, I could have done that better. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. I guess. Uh, at least some of it be comes from because um, I started recording music very early on. So my ear developed really fast and I started hearing all the kind of the little, you know, dirt when you, for example, when you play guitar, if you want to play clean, you got to pluck a lot of the strings and then, you know, damp the strings in order to play clean. And when you record, you really, and listen back, you can hear it. and. Uh, you know, when I was a teenager, my father had this uh, four-track C cassette uh, uh, recording. You know, yeah, I remember those. Yeah, and I started recording with that. That, and then I got an A track, and then sixteen track, and then came, you know, the PCs and you know, Q bases and broad tools. So I've all, always been recording music, and I, my ear just have gotten better and better and better through the years. To, hear those little details and uh, they always kind of been bothering me so i and i also like you know lots of electronic music and that's very clean music you know it's not like black metal which needs to be dirty in order to sound good <laughs> <laughs> so i guess it comes from you know liking electronic music also and kind of been recording for a very long time 
Do you feel that perhaps also a, a part of that is, I, I have this impression since I've discovered the band and since I started listening to the band, I, I get the impression that Winter Sun fans are, are on a class of their own. There is, you know, metal fans and then there are Winter Sun fans. And to me, the Winter Sun fans are more knowledgeable about music, about guitar playing in general than your rest of, and I'm not discriminating the rest of the metal fans, but I just find the Winterson fans tend to be more technical aware, if you will. Does is that does that play a role as well that you know that you're going to be judged a lot harder than you know your run of the mill metal band when you put something out? Yeah, maybe, but I think that's a general trend for many other bands, like Dream Theater, for example. It's like music for musicians. <laughs> You know, if it's a really complicated music, then people who, you know, do music themselves, you know, they get get more kick out of it. You know, if they understand, you know, more complicated music. But uh, of course, people who don't understand can enjoy it too. But I think that's part of it. It's hard to say because. Um, And it it can go actually other way around because uh, I've always enjoyed complicated music, but now nowadays I'm, I'm finding beauty in simple music because I've always written pretty complicated music. So I've never actually. It's kind of now that I've tried to make more kind of uh, simple music, so to say. It's actually not that easy. <laughs> <laughs> So when you hear, you know, uh, those hit songs in the radio, you actually, because a lot of those melodies are all already done. So it's not, it's not that easy to make a like an original song that doesn't remind me, right, reminds you of, you know, of other songs that have already been made. That makes sense. I uh, sometimes uh, easy is never that easy. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question from from one of our viewers who's watching this live broadcast right now, and I have to ask you this question because it popped up and it really caught my attention. And it's from Dennis. He's asking if you have any plans to re-release uh, immemorial material. Uh, I think that falls well with this perfection thing. Maybe you can go and tweak it a little bit and re-release it. Well, I mean, never say never, but uh, at the moment I'm. Um, I prefer to write mu new music and work on that because I already have so much new music that I want to record and release. So at the moment, I'm you know focusing on that. Well, you gave me the perfect. If, I, if I'm bored, bored at some day, then I maybe <laughs> <laughs> bored. For some reason, I think you're you're the kind of guy you're never bored. There's always something yeah. going on in your yeah. life. Well, that, that's a, that's actually I've thought about that too, uh, and some days because. When I was a kid, there was days like were boring, no, nothing to do. <laughs> But nowadays, I'm always, you know, I'm never bored. <laughs> There's always something to do. Yeah, I, I can imagine you. You're, you're I, I honestly, I don't imagine you walking around the house with with you know pajama pants on, your coffee mug, and nothing to do whatsoever. Like I'm, I'm thinking in in the perception that I have is in your mind, the wheels are constantly turning. Yeah. Yeah, that's the creative thing. Even if you're not making the music, you know, if you're going to the grocery store to buy some milk, <laughs> <laughs> I'm always constantly thinking about a certain song that I'm working on. It, it, having said that, have you ever woken up in the middle of the night with a cool riff in your mind or a piece of a song and you're like, okay, I got to get up right away, record this before I forget it? Yeah, many times. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, luckily nowadays we have iPhones, so it's very easy to just pick up the recorder and put there. Yeah, record. that's true. That's true. And, and I usually, you know, kind of uh, do a riff library and uh, name to, na try to name what the style is and what kind of riff, riff it is. So then it's easier to find later and start, you know, working on those riffs and melodies. Yeah. So you have like a database of guitar riffs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to me that's incredible that's incredible and since we're talking about you're saying that you have a lot of material to record so my, that kind of lead me into my next question which is 
Do you have any ideas about what you're going to incorporate in the next crowdfunding project? And the second part of that question is, will that be the last crowdfunding project or you think there will be future crowdfunding projects? Well, originally we planned to do three crowdfundings, but um, I don't know yet. We'll, we're going to do the second one and let's see if we can gather enough resources to build the Windows on headquarters. So if, if there's a need to do three crowdfundings. But of course, it's a, as it turned out, it was such a good you know, business idea. And uh, nowadays, we have the right to sell our own music uh, digitally. So I don't know what the future holds. I mean, this music business is just crazy and it's changing all the time. You know? So it's just got to adapt. Everybody that I've but, talked to, but yeah, the plan, plan is to do, do a second crowdfunding, and and there's going to be a new album on it. Wow, that's great news! Uh, so, w when can the fans expect that second crowdfunding to be available? <laughs> well, that is a question that I'm <laughs> <laughs> never going to answer again. <laughs> I, I just kind of went around it. <laughs> I'm just going to say I don't know, but. I hope as soon as possible. Uh, yeah, the the I'm sure everybody is on the edge of their seat to get their hands because on. For, for me, for me, deadlines don't work. It's I understand it. It works works for many people, but for me, it's the best way for me to work the fastest is to have just you know nothing in my calendar, no distractions and no deadlines, just to be you know free. Then I work the fastest. So like leave you alone and just yeah. let the, the natural yeah. process happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The world yeah. has to leave me alone, then I I you know work work the best. And the question is, once you create that Winter Sun headquarters, you're gonna have the ability to be alone and be creative. So are, are you gonna be disappearing into this Winter Sun headquarters almost like a druid? And then you know, pop out every so often because I can see you being the kind of guy that that you you could really get lost in your own creative process and in your own music and almost shut down the world around you. Well, that's the thing. I I, re I really need that you know to be in that world. You know, create all the ideas and let the imagination fly. Then then I can create the music. You know, if there's all all this, you know ordinary day distraction all the time I, I can't focus I mean uh, I, I do music here and there of course but when there's nothing in the calendar then I really delve into this world different world and make the music I mean uh, during the forest when I made the forest series album there was actually I got this kind of a break for me that kind of uh, because time two didn't work out so then everyone kind of forget us. And that was kind of, for me, a good thing. So I could, no one was bothering me and <laughs> I could just focus on making this album. And uh, it turned out I made the album in nine months, which is gonna record <laughs> for me. No, but that's... Actually, you know, because I made the, made the photos and the album booklets, everything myself. So that was the reason why it took more than the nine months. The booklet actually uh, took 18 months <laughs> because I didn't know anything about photography or you know Photoshop or anything. So I learned everything from scratch. Wow, I'm, I, honestly, I'm impressed. I didn't know that. Like, that's incredible, <laughs> you know? To, to... Yeah, basically worked like eight hours music uh, from the day and then the evening I started, you know, learning Photoshop. <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, I, I, like I said, I, I saw that documentary that you guys put together during the creative process and putting the songs together, it even shows you guys going into the woods and taking the pictures and that whole process. I thought it was really cool for me to get that inside look to how everything happened. Would that be something that you guys would do again for the next crowdfunding, something along those lines where, after you guys release the crowdfunding, then there will be something that gives the fans a little bit of an inside look into how everything happened. Yeah, we're definitely gonna try to do document more what we do. 
but as for the photography stuff um, at the moment i feel i want to leave that to somebody else now and uh because now i can actually hire someone you know pay someone to do it so i can i can then uh focus more on the music and put my time you know the actual music making uh, you, you mentioned earlier that the music business has changed and, and somebody just asked a question um, that's watching, just asked a question related to that. And I'm not going to ask his question, but I'm going to morph his question into a new question. I, I talk to a lot of guys from different bands and everybody says the same thing. It's really hard to be a full time musician. It's really hard to make money these days in the music business. Uh, a lot of guys are in different bands. A, a lot of guys have a, a regular job. How how really difficult it is these days to be a full time musician? Uh, it's hard. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I think it's always been hard, but now it's just hard dif in different ways. Uh, I mean, it, when when there was more like there was no downloads and everybody had to you know buy CDs and stuff, of course. There was, you know, burning, burning CDs and stuff, but, you know, record sales were, you know, much higher. Uh, so then only few bands got, you know, and of course, back, back in the day, uh, people couldn't really record the music themselves. But nowadays, it's much easier to make music with all that really cool, you know, uh, audio interfaces and, you know, plugins and stuff. It's really easy. And uh, it's really easy to promote yourself with Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and put your music on Bandcamp. So in that ways, it's easier now if you kind of do it yourself. Uh, but uh, it's pretty hard, hard to say. Yeah, it's some somehow di more difficult because you cannot sell that much, you know, physical product products, but then it's much, much, much easier for you to get uh, noticed from YouTube and stuff like that. So, so our, the, the, the impression that I get is that these days it's easier to get your product out there. It's hard to make money on that product. So really the, the impression as a fan, the impression that I get from Benz these days that really the income is really coming from merchandise that you guys sell at the shows. And obviously the tours and the live shows, because yeah. it doesn't look to me that there's a lot of money being made on the actual records themselves. And and you see a trend now with bands actually releasing the records like for free and and labels streaming the whole record on YouTube on the day of the release, which would have been unthinkable, you know, yeah. a bunch of years ago. But actually, it's it's not that hopeless because I, I still think that people want to pay for music and. I think we kind of prove, prove, prove that with the crowdfunding. And now we have also a band camp site and, uh, you know, we're selling, you know, not as much as the crowdfunding, but you know, it, you know, it get a few, uh, purchases, you know, you know, here and there, or it's make, makes quite okay. So I think if you're a new band, it's very important, you know, just get your music out there and promote the shit out of it. And then you just grow and grow and grow. You no, know, it's just just like usually you just grow grow the business. And of course play live and you know. Yeah, I I, I I honestly I'm one of those guys that when I go to a live show, I always pick up merch because I really want to support the band. And yeah. you know, I, I find that it's probably the easiest way to get some money in the band's pocket. Yeah, by buying true. by buying that shirt, that patch, whatever it is, I, I've honestly gone to shows where I've spent more money on the merch than I did on the ticket to get into the venue. So, yeah. uh, I really, really want to help them that way. If that's the the only way I can help them, you know. And the other thing is, um, which makes it hard hard to be success successful these days because there's so many bands and so much competition. <laughs> so it's really hard to stand out. So you just gotta, you know. Learn the guitar and learn <laughs> music, and you know, stand out from the crowd. Uh, I have a question for you in terms of um, still within the crowdfunding idea. Did you guys ever thought about 
uh, and, and I'm thinking this from a fan's perspective that I've never seen you guys live. And like me, there's many people who are Winter Sun fans who's never had a chance to see the band play live. Have you guys thought about perhaps a combo package of a live concert CD with a live concert DVD uh, as part of a, a future crowdfunding project or even outside of crowdfunding? Uh, yeah, we actually thought about many things like that. But uh, then, because uh, we don't have like, a, we cannot manufacture CDs or DVDs ourselves. So we just uh, decided to do all digital package. And it's much, much easier, you know, uh, to like deliver the pro product to the fans, you know, just they can download it. And of course, for me, I think, uh, you know, CDs, and many people still love CDs and vinyl, that's cool. But for me, I haven't bought a CD in a long time. And uh, I don't have a CD player anymore. And I think it's probably for many, many people like that. You know, they can they stream from Spotify or listen from YouTube or whatever. But it's still cool if, you know, people want, want CDs. It's really nice to hold them package in your hand and what's all the artwork and stuff. Yeah, I think the vinyls now is really changing the way uh, music is being consumed. There is this new revival for people wanting to get their hands on vinyls. I, I'm actually contemplating buying a player and start purchasing vinyl all over again, you know? Yeah, it, it's cool, but it's uh, actually not my cup of tea because uh, uh, vinyl changes the sound I mean it, it can change it for the better you know it's just that sound is also always subjective you like it or you don't but then it's not my vision anymore because when I mix and master the album and I export export the file then that's it that's how, how it should sound then if you convert that to vinyl it doesn't sound anymore like that so I prefer that people listen to the original, you know, master file. But of course, it's cool because you can buy the vinyl and get a, like a second opinion, other perspective, how it sounds. <laughs> that comes the, that, that's the perfection in you coming out where, you, you know, you work hard on, on that song or that album and, you, and it's your vision of what perfection should be. So you really want everybody to hear that, not... You know, no, I prefer you know, people listening to the original master file, and then if they want the vinyl to get a second, second opinion, <laughs> and then that's cool also. Uh, one of the questions that popped in in the comments was um, music videos. I, I, I want to be honest with you. The first song I was introduced to was Sons of Winter and Stars. So I saw that live, if you want to call it live, but that live performance in the studio. And, yeah, and, I, and I saw that reaction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's cool. Like, thank, thank you very much for all the reactions. I've seen them all. It's wow, cool. wow. I, uh, yeah, we, we had a, a thing called Winter Sunday going on for like a yeah, period. Of, that was really fun. <laughs> yeah, a period of like three months where we watched one winter. It, it was, it, just to, to give you a little bit of a background on that was, uh, I wanted to have that experience with my son together. Mm -hmm. He's 13. So his mind doesn't work the same as my mind works. He doesn't have the patience to sit down and listen to a full album. He gets bored. He's like short attention span, right? Yeah. So I wanted to have that experience with him. I thought it was important for us to bond. And so the only way I could think of doing that was if we sit down every Sunday and we listen to one song until yeah. we listen to every single song from Winter Sun. And it, it really worked because... It was just one song at a time, and he was able to listen to every single song and, and grow uh, as a listener as he understood the music better and better with every song that went by. Yeah, that's great. You're, you're a really cool dad. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I, I hope he knows that. I hope he knows that. Um, so going back to Sons of Winter and Stars, which, by the way, it, at one point was my son's favorite song. And uh, every, every, anytime you would hear the word winter sun at a, any point in time, he would always reply, sons of winter and stars. Like, that's all he would say as a reply. 
So that song to me, it, it, I think part of, of, of my love for the band was also being able to see you guys play in that video and see all the details like Kai sweating and wiping up his sweat and stuff like that. And and to me, that was part of the, of the moment that I knew I, I was falling in love with the band was not just listening to the music, but seeing you playing it. Mm-hmm. But you guys don't do a lot of music videos. Is there is that a, a is it because it financially is expensive to do music videos or no, you don't feel financial and schedule wise? Actually, no, no, we have been planning a music video, but there isn't still a concrete plan. But and now we have some money to make one. But uh, for me, it's like I really want to do new music now and focus on that. So. We'll see what happens. You know, I really want to do music video also, but let's see. And going back to you as a guitar player, you decided about a year ago, maybe a little bit longer, but that's when it was announced that you yeah. were going to stop playing guitar and you brought a seam on board and you were just going to concentrate on the vocals. Was that decision made with live performances in mind or are you are you completely not gonna play guitar even on studio work you're just gonna concentrate 100 percent on the vocals yeah actually i was thinking about it for already a few years before i made the decision and uh it was mostly you know you know for the making of albums in mind because that really takes extra energy from me and time you know, to play guitar and sing live, you know, and always, you know, relearn all the songs and, uh, you know, keep practicing them. So that takes time away, uh, you know, you know, to make, make new music. So that, that was the main reason. And of course it was very, very challenging, you know, you know, stamina wise and technique wise. Uh, and I wanted to have, bit more fun you know you know do on the stage so that we it, it would be more fun to tour and do more shows and uh and in the future i, I was already thinking that the, in the future the music is going to be even more technical so i was thinking okay i'm not gonna be able to do this stuff anymore <laughs> <laughs> so i think after the forest seasons well the forest seasons is still stuff i could play play and uh, Play and sing at the same time. It's not that complicated, but uh, I think that it was just the right time to do it because we really wanted to tour a lot after the forest seasons. And then I wanted to also, in the meanwhile, start working on new material because I want to do more albums and do them faster and release them faster. Well, everybody's going to be happy with that. Yeah. <laughs> <Can't win. laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a word exactly. You you get you get to to create more stuff. We get to listen to more stuff. Everybody's happy, and exactly. and then you added a seam to the mix. I, I interviewed him. And last I'm still, gonna, I'm still gonna play guitar, and I'm gonna release some guitar videos here and there. Oh, you you planning on doing some some stuff like that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I interviewed a seam last week, as you know, and we went through a little bit of the process that he had to go through to join the band. Uh, sorry, um, who? Uh, a seam. Oh yeah, I see. And uh, we went through some questions. I asked him how was the process. Like, what did these guys made you do before you joined the band? You know, and we went through that kind of stuff. Uh, how, how picky were you, really, when you were looking at the candidates and who would be the guy playing guitar? Because as a professionalist as you are, obviously, I'm sure in your mind you're thinking nobody can do better than me. So mm-hmm. I have to find somebody who can do as close to what I can do as possible, even though I know they're not as good as me. So yeah. how how difficult it was for you to really uh, narrow it down to the last guy? Well, it was a really hard decision at the end, and uh, we were really picky. But I think the last the last round when we recorded a few guys playing uh, Sons of Winter and Stars, the whole song, uh, and then we when we listened to it back, it was actually funny because when you look at look at Asim's playing, it actually uh, looks when he when he's playing in front of you. It actually looks a bit more sloppy than the other guys guys who played in front of us. But then when we listen to back from the tape, it actually was tighter or 
just as tight as, as the other guys. And he had more kind of a more similar style to me, which I liked. And uh, then it fits with them also, uh, because uh, we have this specific picking technique that is uh, needed in Winter Sun to make, to do, play all those riffs tightly. And then he had lots of cool phrasing and, uh, you know, you know, playing the melodies. He had like really cool vibrato and, you know, you know, articulations and stuff. So that was the main reason why we picked Asim. Is, um, has this performed, because you guys went live uh, on tour with Arch Enemy and you got to see him play and interact with the fans. Have have that interaction and his performances live been exactly what you guys thought it was going to be, that addition of the guitarist, you just concentrating on the vocals? Has everything been exactly what you had envisioned that the band would be as far as their new path and their new growth? Well, not exactly, but, you know, it's been working out really great and he has a a really great live charisma. Of course, he's some, he has some <laughs> some nice moves on the stage. <laughs> so, <laughs> very, very sexy moves. <laughs> <laughs> That's also fun. Something for the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he told me a story about somebody throwing a bra on stage. Yeah, I remember it vaguely. And uh, I think our drum tech put it on the drum drums. <laughs> Uh, I, I have a hypothetical question for you. If we put you on on a on a space shuttle and we sent you to meet the Martians at some point in time, and you were asked to introduce the Martians to Winter Sun as a way of explaining to them what kind of music humans listen to, what song from Winter Sun would you pick to be that introduction? Like the first song they hear. Yeah, that's, they've never heard any music. And they never heard any Winter Sun, and you're you're our representative, and you have to pick one Winter Sun song. W which song do you think would be the best song to be the first one? I guess it would have to be Sons of Winter and Stars because because it has everything, and it's kind of now been our kind of our main main you know hit song. <laughs> but hopefully, I can change that at some point to make a new Sons of Winter and Stars better one <laughs> yeah it's funny you say that one because that that was also my introduction to winter sun and, and i think it is a lot of people's introduction to winter sun is through that song uh, it, it's having yeah, said that to me song. sorry kind of a monster song <laughs> yeah it's to me it was a song that really took me on a journey uh i i didn't know winter sun before i heard that song and listening to that song at the end of it i i was like uh, it, it it was really a journey. Like it really took me in places that I had never gone before. Yeah, that was kind of the idea. <laughs> the idea, <laughs> including with the intro when time fades away. It's kind of part of that song. And and, and the vocals. And I find that in that song, your vocals is is. And I think for any musician, the vocals is their instrument. And obviously, it is an instrument, and it's part of the music. But in that song, it really is an instrument. It really is, is an additional instrument that it's being used to really give the full essence of what that song is about. Yeah, thanks. I think uh, during the time recordings, I really took some time, you know, because I recorded all the vocals in various rehearsal places, just with my laptop and at SM7B, you know, the Shure mic. So I really took time for myself to practice a lot more singing. And, so I, I kind of make during those recordings I kind of made a made a breakthrough with my clean vocals and well the crawling as well you know and um, I kind of learned to sing the first time I think <laughs> and uh, I think with the forest seasons I uh, got in into a even into next level so hopefully I can go more level levels in the future. Having heard every single song you've ever made, uh, I, I mean, every single song you've ever made that you've released, because I'm sure there's material that we've never heard, mm. I, I can now see a progression in your vocals from the first album to time one and then to the to the four seasons. So I, I do see that progression. 
Is that something that has to do with your own growth as a musician as well? Yeah, I definitely. I think I was never meant to be a singer. It's just something that happened because there wasn't singers around. And then I started recording my own music and I made these songs and okay, I don't have a singer. Okay, I got to sing myself. So I just started writing lyrics and tried to sing. And I, I really sucked at the beginning. <laughs> it's just, it's just horrible. <laughs> but then you just do it more and more and uh, you learn. And that's how it goes. Just gotta keep at it. And the, the thing that helped me the most was, you know, you could, I could record my vocals and then listen to it back. Because for a lot of people, it's like they sing, but they never, never record it and they don't know how they sound. So they can never be critical of themselves. So it's really important to know how you sound and how it sounds recorded. When, when you're putting a, um, any song together, but when you're working on your music, obviously you work on your music first and then the lyrics come after. I'm assuming that's the process that you use. Yeah, mostly. Um, when, when you're working on the lyrics, do you hear the song and then the lyrics kind of just come to you and you just fit them into that song? Or do you kind of have, or does the song speak to you in terms of what that song really calls for in terms of what the story of that song needs to be? Yeah, usually the song starts to speak to me at some point during the process. Uh, I got, get some lines or certain words and I put them down and then I compose the song even more and then more, more lyrics. And it's kind of, a, yeah, the song kind of gives me the lyrics. But then at some point I finish the song, kind of the whole structure. And then I have a lot of different lines that kind of matches the song and the song's feeling. And at that point, I start to, you know, to finish the lyrics, put all the puzzle pieces together, and then try to then start to arrange the, you know, the vocals into the song. And when I'm make, making a song, I always kind of knew, okay, that's, this is going to be crawling vocals, so then this is going to be a clean part, and so on. But it, it can change. Sometimes songs surprise me. Especially loneliness. <laughs> that was supposed to be like a, just a pure black metal track. You know, you know, the first riff, you know, the whole song, only that riff. And just like this hypnotic feeling and, you know, high crawling screeches on top. <laughs> it didn't go that way. Black metal, black metal is sound. But then at some point, the song just started to change. And I'm really happy how it changed. So it surprised me. I'm happy you mentioned loneliness because I was going to ask my next question to you is how how it was the process of then stripping that song down and creating the acoustic version of that song? Yeah, well, uh, I always kind of thought that okay, this this would make a this would work as acoustic song because the riffs well all, already kind of acoustic riffs, you know, they they weren't these like heavy heavy riffs with palm muting and stuff, you know, just playing all these arpeggiated chords. So I knew that would work as acoustic. But then there was there were some challenges, you know, how to arrange some stuff. But uh, I think in the end, the arrangement was pretty easy. But then the recordings were uh, the bigger challenge because as you said, <laughs> I'm a kind of perfectionist. So, and acoustic guitars are very difficult to record especially in tune <laughs> and ever tune is not yet yet still for acoustic guitars so <laughs> that was just hell <laughs> I, i'm thinking by your comments that we will we will never see an unplugged winter sun album <laughs> <laughs> i don't know we we've, we've been you know wondering about that as well because some other songs would work great as well like sleeping stars death and the healing land of snow and sorrow so I don't know. Maybe in the future. I, I uh, you just I, for sleeping stars. I have a really good arrangement for that, for the chorus with with clean vocals. And, and your vocals. Do you do anything to to maintain that? Like especially when you're on tour, show after show, night after night. Is there anything you do to ensure that your vocals stay fresh? Well, nowadays I do. Uh, when I was in my twenties, I never really. Uh, warmed up 
at all. But during the time recordings, because I was crawling and screaming, you know, five, six hours a day <laughs> from the top of my lungs, I started to got some issues. So I went to a couple of doctors and uh, they gave me some tips, but mostly what helped, and I started to warm up more better and do lip rolls and, you know, these warming up techniques. And ever since I haven't had a problem. You know, I, I have the sense of screaming. Uh, that's that's really great. One question that everybody has been asking in the comments below, um, and one question that I have, because I, I saw Nightwish in Toronto uh, about three weeks ago and Kai was drumming. Um, yeah. Is he going to be making a return to Winter Sun or is his stay with Nightwish a more permanent one? Well, it's hard to say. Future is unknown. <laughs> yeah. But he's still our drummer, so we don't know what will happen. The plan was uh, to tour with him, but then he injured his hand, and that was a problem. And uh, then for this year, he's touring with Night with the whole year. So just schedules, uh, always a schedule thing. If he has all free time, I'm sure he, he would love to come and play. And, and in relation to that, I have to ask you this, because it seems like everybody that I talk to that's in a band in Finland, there are multiple bands. Is there a, a number that you say, okay, enough is enough? I mean, I know you're you're 100% with Winter Sun, but is, is it important for you to have people around you that are as committed in, as you are to that project, to the band? Or, you know, in some cases, you have to understand that, you know, they want to go and do something else, and, and that's okay, too. Yeah, of course. I mean... When I got the opportunity, if he wouldn't have taken it, I would have kick his, kicked his ass. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to go to play Nightwish because it's a really huge opportunity for him. And he has a you know family and kids and stuff. So he definitely need, needed to do that. So it's very understandable. But we, we've been really fine so far. We Apparently, there's, there's no shortage of really good drummers in Finland. <laughs> I was going to say there's no shortage of good musicians in Finland. Period. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so yeah. far most of the song, most of the uh, shows have we have been doing with uh, Rolf, who is actually the drummer of uh, Stratovarius also, and he's been fitting really well. That's amazing job. Is it is it going to because you guys had a set. When, when he joined and you guys went on tour with uh, Arch Enemy, you guys had a set list throughout the tour. Now with this by request, does that, I mean, there's an, an, a little bit of extra work for you uh, as well, because like you said, you have to kind of re-practice some of the old songs. But for the yeah. new guys coming in, it's going to be way more challenging for them, don't you think? Yeah, they, they have to learn all the songs from scratch. and uh, But I think it will be fine. I think Rolf said that no problem. <laughs> and uh, professional. has learned all the other songs, and I think so it's not going to be a problem. Uh, I have two more questions for you uh, because I, don't, I really don't want to take too much of your time, and I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me today. And yeah, no problem. one of the that questions is any plans for beyond the by request? Is there any plans for 2018 that you can share with us? I'm sure there is plans you cannot share because they're not finalized and they're in the secret of the gods and the winter sun gods. But uh, yeah. is there anything you can share with the fans as far as touring, uh, North America, Japan, anything like that, and anything at all? Well, we have a couple of uh, festivals late summer. And Wacken is the big one that we haven't... Oh, I think it was 2006 when I played there. So it's nice to go back there. It's so big festival, and hopefully will be as amazing as the first time. It was the first time there was a sea of people and it was kind of nerve-wracking. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we we have something coming in the autumn, but cannot reveal it yet. But we're going to places where we haven't been in a, in a while. <laughs> That's, That's all. <laughs> That's all you can say. That's good. I, I, I'm I taking that as a hint and I kind of, I'm putting two and two together in my own mind. Um, the last yep. question. About, sorry? 
you think what you think <laughs> <laughs> exactly uh, it, th that kind of uh, answer is perfect because everybody is going to have their own interpretation of what the answer is but we're going to announce it very soon well i'll tell you one thing if you guys come to toronto on any north american tour uh there is going to be a barbecue at my house for you guys. I've, I've invited a bunch of bands, not at the same time, because they're not going to be touring together at the same time. But you guys for sure are invited to my place for a Portuguese Canadian barbecue with some local Canadian beer. All right. Thank you very much for the invitation. We'll see how it go. Hopefully we can make it. I, I, don't, I don't have a sauna. So that part we have to kind of remove from the equation, but okay, then it then it's canceled. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I was thinking maybe I should rent a, a hot tub. I mean, that's as close as we could get to a sauna. I was hinting, you know, renting a hot tub, putting in the backyard, and then we yeah, could take turns. That's the next best thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be the next best thing. Uh, yeah. But I, I just want to give you that invitation. Uh, if you guys come right. to Toronto and you have, because sometimes bands come in on one day and their show is not until the next day and there is some hours that you guys have, I'm more than happy to take you guys to do some sightseeing along, around the city. There's a lot of great places to visit, to see, to, to have different kinds of food. If you guys, that's one of the beauties about Toronto is that you can eat food from any part of the world here, right? So, you know, I really want to give you that invitation to take you guys around and obviously come over and have some barbecue. All right. We'll see. Thanks. <laughs> One last thing I wanted to mention to you is a, a really a personal thing, but I really wanted to share it with you because I think it's important that sure. um, I, I really feel like I really need to share that with you. You said that you watched all our reaction videos. Uh, it was really big part uh, of our growth for me and my son, our growth as, as Winter Sun fans. And, and and listening to your music are winter Sundays that we had every single Sunday. And we started with Sons of Winter and Stars uh, and we just, we, we did time one and then we went, we did the, the the four seasons, then we went back to Winter Sun and we did every single song in order. <clears throat> During this time, my father passed away. Uh, he passed away in, in uh, late, late yeah. October. Yeah, late October, uh, early November, he passed away. And I remember when I went to his funeral, the music that I was really listening on the plane there and even while I was there was Winter Sun. I, I, that's all I really listened to. And, and because I didn't want to ruin the listening experience of sitting down with my son, I, I could only listen to songs that we already had covered on the channel. So mm -hmm. I, I remember Time and Loneliness were the two songs that really helped me deal with that extremely difficult time in my life. And then I remember coming back and the first song that we sat down to do uh, when I returned to Canada after, after the funeral was uh, Death and the Healing. And it, it was like, I, I, you know, the stars could not have been aligned any better to have that song as the song that you come back to after such a difficult period. So yeah. I, really, I really find that those three songs to me um, will always have a very special place in my heart. The band will always have a very special place in my heart because... You guys have really helped me through your music, through the lyrics in those songs, really helped me deal with something that I have never dealt with before. Uh, mm -hmm. It was an extremely difficult moment. And I'll tell you right now, I'm getting emotional just even talking about it. But every time I hear those songs, I, I cannot contain my tears because every time I listen to any one of those songs, if I'm in the car driving on my iPad, it, it takes me back. To that moment but it's 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 not tears necessarily uh, of sadness I love some of those songs as well yeah it's it's not tears of sadness i'll tell you it's it's more yeah. tears of of uh, of understanding what has gone on have gotten used to it grown with it and yeah. listening to, to those songs really allowed me to heal and and that's why death and the healing is my favorite song and i think the reason why is because of, of of how important that song helped me heal during such a difficult moment. And, and yeah. I just wanted to share that with you. And and, and the last question is, are, are, do you guys hear stories like this about your music? It, it, do, do you guys understand how impactful uh, your music is, not just from a listening perspective in terms of enjoying the music, but also from almost like a therapeutical perspective, how important it is for your fans? Yeah, sometimes we hear those stories and uh, uh, it really warms your heart and it's 
really, really nice to hear that that I I can make something that you know brings you know happiness and comfort to people. And uh, for me, music is all also like a healing power. Uh, I don't know how how would I live if there was no music. <laughs> so yeah, it's uh it's really nice. Well, on that note, I want to thank you for taking the time to sit down with me today and answering all my questions. I, I hope you enjoyed it. And yeah. uh, and uh, let's make a deal. Uh, next time when you guys release your next crowdfunding, let's do this again and talk about the new project. Sure, absolutely. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Yari. Hey, thank you very much. <laughs>